Yeah, welcome back. It's still the run-up. We know that in our country today, a lot of people are complaining in one way or the other, something must touch you. We are hearing of high-profile kidnaps from uh, every quarter and from every corner of our nation. Uh, people as high as lawmakers are being kidnapped. People as high as uh, contestants in the forthcoming election are being kidnapped. We've also had cases of lawlessness coming from people that we should not expect ordinarily. We just heard a story about um, the wife of a DSS director general ordering the arrest of uh, a, a candidate of the new Nigeria People's Party in one of the states here in the country. Why? Because the convoy of the candidate obstructed her own movement, so she ordered the arrest of the candidate of that party. And we've seen people riding motorcycles and, and cars with plate numbers that are only carrying brother of this uh, local government chairman <laughs> of a particular party. We've seen very funny things here happening. But we are most, most disturbed about what is happening in the economy and security because that is where we all hang our livelihood. If the economy is bad, you don't need an expert to talk to you about it. If security is not there, you don't need an expert to tell you that your life is not safe. But right now, we are also concerned by the fact that President Mohammed Madhu Buhari last week accented to the $21.83 trillion 2023 appropriation bill. He signed it into law, and that is his last as the president. The president had, in the fiscal document, proposed an annual budget of 20.51 uh, trillion Naira for 2023, showing a 19.8% increase from 17.13 trillion Naira approved for 2022, including the supplementary budget. And we wonder why every year the budget has to go up. So there are things that have to come into the policy and things that are uh, supposed to be repeated, so to speak. Because sometimes when we do our budgets as personal people, as in private individuals in our homes, maybe one year it will be very tedious, it will be very consuming of our finances and all that. But when we get some things settled, the next year we budget less for less things that we need. But it's not the case in the national life. Uh, we will have to get closer to where they eat the porridge to understand how it really smells. The president said the aggregated expenditure of 218 3 trillion naira was in an increase of 1.32 trillion naira over the initial executive proposal of a total expenditure of 20.51 trillion naira. Just recently, the Debt Management Office DMO said Nigeria's total debt stock would hit 77 trillion in May 2023. If the National Assembly okayed the Buhari administration's 23.8 trillion naira or 23.8 trillion ways and means advances that he wants to borrow more through the ways and means. Meanwhile, the federal government stated that it spent over 80% of its revenue on debt servicing in the first 11 months of 2022. The Minister of Finance and Budget and National Planning, Mrs. Zainab Ahmed, on her part, had said there is no cause for alarm over the country's debt profile because the nation has no record of default. But experts say the significant implication of the government's over-reliance on short-term borrowing to finance its operations as the government has had to pay higher interest rates to attract investors and for flaring inflation. Now, we are joined by an expert, Dr. Biodin Adedikbe. He is an economic expert. Good morning and thanks for joining us, Dr. Adedikbe, on the run-up. Good morning. It's my pleasure to be here, and thanks for having me. Okay, this budget, it went in as slightly above $20 trillion and the National Assembly jacked it up to more than what the executive arm sent to the legislature. But now it has been accented. Let's begin with the fact that um, it seems as if the, the budget was passed in a horrid manner, because if the president saw some things within the budget that he talked about, he complained about, and said some committees will be set up and people will look into it and then they see what they can correct. Why was there need to hasten to pass this budget in the first place, in your opinion? Well, let me thank you very much for that. I will take it from the perspective of having been privileged to interrogate this space for well over 40 years now. And the one grew up as a professional in this space, seen an era in Nigeria where 
government bodies were signed into law at the beginning of the year. In fact, traditionally, on the 1st of January every year, the budget of the federal government of Nigeria was always out. And within that same week, and usually, the finance minister will do the breakdown at an international press conference. That was the pattern. So, but over the years, when we began this democratic dispensation, we departed from that. So that also began to affect the planning cycle in the private sector. Because we got to a point where it was so bad that the budget was signed into law in May of the year of its operation. In which case, we now had to rely on what was approved in the preceding year budget as a guide to spending and now begin to talk about implementation of the current year in May. So for me, correcting that and bringing it back to January is a plus, all right? Now, talking about reconciliation, typically, anytime it comes to finances, there is always the need to reconcile issues and items. So for me, the interpretation is a choice between whether to sign a budget into law right now or to delay signing of the bill and making it an act and now insisting that once we reconcile all the items of you know differences between what the executive presented and what the lawmakers you know brought in as amendments. So if we have to wait for that, then we lose the opportunity of having a budget given to all of Nigerians and our stakeholders so that we can also plan accordingly. And this is in context, very important. If you take our GDP and aggregate all government's expenditures, that is federal, state, and local, throughout the country. Assuming even their budget, they're able to implement 100%. All governments taken together in Nigeria will just be about 10% of our GDP. Which means, until we have the policy statement, which the budget represents, the remaining 90% of the economy cannot make any clear commitment and plans in terms of going forward. So for me, it's a wise decision to sign it because we now know that beyond the fiscal operation, that is revenue generation and expenditure plans, there are also what we call commercial policies in that budget. And of course, these also have heavy implications for business. So for me, it's a plus that it was signed into law. It's an act. So we know what those policies are. So what people talk more about is government spending vis-a-vis -vis revenue. Whereas the budget is a lot more than that. It has also the trade and exchange component, and it has the, you know, the, the uh, what do we call the, um, the policies, tariff policies that come in there as well. So those three components make up the budget. But people often emphasize the spending and revenue generation. So for me, that is the advantage of signing it and then talking about reconciliation later. Oh, okay, but I, I don't seem to understand, and it's not, it's not far-fetched. The budget, what's the max advantage of signing the budget in January? Because a fiscal year doesn't have to follow the Gregorian calendar, for instance. It's just like a school year that starts in December, and you begin to count. In Nigeria, for instance, um, a political year, if you allow me, begins in May. So why must we sign a budget in January, what advantage does it bring to our economy by signing it in well, January? And especially like this one, that things still needed to be reconciled, but they were not, and they signed it. What advantage are we having? Now, I'm a business strategist, and I've been in that space for over 33 years. In fact, 34 years counting now as a business strategist. When you design strategy for businesses, we need to understand this, that without a clear direction of government policy, you can't firmly plan strategy for any business. All right? And like I said, don't forget that fiscal operations talks about how do we generate revenue from where? And then what does government want to spend on? That is just one plank of the budget every year. There are two other plans that relate to tariff structure that is structure we talk about custom duties, excise duties, and the rest of them. Then, of course, we have trade and exchange, which relates to your monetary policy. They make up the entire plan of the year that are made up, I mean, that make up the budget. So without that complete picture, I can assure you there is no company whose CEO can beat his chest and tell me 
that I've concluded my strategy for the year. And I say this with every sense of responsibility as not only an, a, an a professional economist, but also as a business strategist. That in all reality, I'm waiting to see a budget that tells me what the trade policy for the year is, what the exchange rate policy for the year is, what the customs tariff is, what is happening to import duties, what is happening to export, I mean, and export tariffs and the rest of them. So excise, all of these things are contained in the budget. So when I get them on time, I'm able to finalize my plans for the year. So that is why, from my own perspective, it's a good thing to have the direction of policy for the year. It is not a political issue. And I think people are mixing things up here. Now, it is not a political calendar. Neither is it running with the calendar of oh, Gregorian calendar of January to December. The plan really is that when you look at businesses and you look at the usual patterns with economies, not just in Nigeria, but all over the world, there's a typical pattern. Beginning of the year, the economy is slow. You can check the history. We deal with the data, okay? And also, toward the end of the year, when you get to November, December especially, the economy slows down. So the space you have in terms of business planning and strategizing is oftentimes between February and March and then October and November. So in which case, the earlier you get a pointer as to policy direction, the easier it is for you to design your strategy for the year as a business person. So what you now want to work on is execution thereafter. So, and that is the perspective of print have coming. So it's a combination of both. Look at the economic side to it, and then look at the business side. Okay. That is why I think for me, it's a plus having it signed, and then you can deal with reconciliation. Reconciliation is a year-long thing. It is not something you do once and for all, as people pretend it to be. Okay. So that is the perspective I'm coming from. And I, I want people to also understand that. It's, it's clear. It's clearer now, uh, because... If from a layman's point of view, you, you can't seem to understand why that is so important. Because, for instance, now in May, a new government is coming in and they had no, no input into the budget of this year. And when they come, there's a possibility that a lot of things that could change, if, especially right. if the new government is not of the APC. Should that mm -hmm. happen, will it affect us as a country, you know, our economy as a country? Fantastic question. Now, typically, whenever there is a change of government in Nigeria, it's May 29th, okay, new government comes into office. Typically, the new government, whether of the same political party or another one, will take another look at the budget mm. and then do a review of that to align with the realities of the moment and what their own policy direction is. That is the way it happens, not only in Nigeria, but globally. So what now we play out is that when a new government comes in, they will come with their own priorities, which certainly will be different than the one that is outgone. All right? So naturally, they will have to do a review of the budget inherited. It happened in 2007 between Obasanjo and Yaradwa. I was involved in that conversation, though not a member of the cabinet, okay? But as a policy advocate in Nigeria, I was involved in that. In fact, I in the part of the conversation, there were certain things in Obasanjo's last budget that were expunged in Yaradwa's first budget. And that, in fact, relates to the issue we are discussing today, the debt profile. Mm -hmm. Because at that time, in Obasanjo's final budget of 2007, there was factored in a $1 billion so-called debt relief, which I challenged at the time that it doesn't exist anywhere. Because you can't put in your budget revenue that didn't earn but present it as a debt you have already paid and you don't need to pay. That is what we call dubious analysis. So, but 2008 budget, you can fact check this. That element was removed by Yara government. So, it is nothing new, even though they were in the same political party. So, every government comes into office with its own priorities, and then naturally, we have to make some amendments to the inherited budget. That's the way it goes all over the world. And I just gave you an illustration typically in Nigeria, that happened 2007-2008.
Okay, I know that our major focus today is debt profile, but before we go into what a lot of Nigerians feel is spelling doom for us, um, we still need to clear mm. some things about the budget. Now, you've had, uh, you've had a privilege to look at this document for 2023, what has been budgeted and how it has been budgeted and all that, and the problems of Nigeria, Nigerians uh, tied to the inflation rate that is... You know, it's skyrocketing. Inflation rates, we are we're operating in about two digits, which is not good enough yeah. for us. Now, having looked at this document, how, how confident are you that the 2023 as a year, as a as fiscal year, will fight the issue of inflation? All right. Thank you very much for that question. Now, I will again dig back into history. God, it was a question that, you know, my son asked me. He's also a professional economist. We have a conversation. I said, the highest inflation rate ever in Nigeria happened in 1995. And that was 72% inflation rate. So the young man asked me, say, hey, if you know this history, what did Nigerians do at that time that now brought inflation down eventually to single digits? I told him a very good question. And that is what I asked myself today. What are the drivers of inflation in Nigeria? The major driver still remains food inflation, which means the core, actually, you might find is already decelerating. The food inflation is still rising. So the question is why? In which case, if we are to break the back of food inflation, then we need to ask about those things that make food not available in the right quantity, those things that make food not to be affordable, and of course, these are just two out of the four elements of food security, okay? So this then will give pointers as to what to address. And what it also means is that the more we produce locally, the better control we have over inflation. Because a portion of that is also important. When you depend on imports for as much as 1.9 trillion Naira every month. That is our average import bill in Nigeria. 1.9 trillion Naira every month we spend on imports. So there is no how that will not also feature in your inflation because that is tied to the exchange value of your currency. So if Naira is losing value, that means imports will get more expensive and that fits into your domestic rate of inflation. Remember, food also, as I mentioned, is a major element. So it means then that dealing with the problem of inflation in Nigeria will require exchange rates, stability, and also ensuring we produce more food that we consume. So that will then link to the security issue you mentioned earlier on, which case security has to be improved significantly so that farmers that run away from their farms because of the fear for their lives will return to the farms and start cultivating. And then we can increase the volume of food that comes into our markets and thereby in the process also reduce our dependence of food imports. So they are all interrelated. And I'm happy you brought this up for conversation. So that will give a pointer as to what we expect the incoming government to do and focus on. But generally, in terms of expectations anyway, for 2003, the most analysts forecast that rate of inflation in Nigeria will drop this year. In the light of the drivers, on the one hand, which relate to food inflation, exchange value of the Naira, which again on the zone was also driven by the period we are in, that is the run-up to the elections of February, March 2023, that typically a lot of cars pulled down. And I also relate that to the redesign of the Naira that Central Bank introduced. Okay, we seem to have lost the audio of Dr. Dedikpe there, but he's been talking to us about... The budget, our, our main discussion today is about the debt profile, but we need to just uh, loosen some knots here and there as regards the budget, how it was done and uh, uh, what hopes Nigerians could have for 2023 because of this budget. It is the highest that we've had because every year it keeps increasing, which means uh, our problems are multiplying, but I'm sure that the solutions also are multiplying. Um, I'm hoping that way. Uh, but our food security is a, is a problem because a lot of people wouldn't mind if there's 
a shortage of any other thing. So long as there is food and then there is shelter, they are covered. No, not many people really care about all the, the fine things of life. They just want to feed, they want to sleep peacefully somewhere and have their peace. But this condition also is threatened and that is why we're looking at this budget. How is it good? Is it going to make Omar Nigeria uh, knowing that we have a lot of debts and all that, because that's what exactly we are going to discuss here. But we've, well, we are hoping Dr. Biodun Adedipe will return, and when he returns, he will answer uh, questions on some gray areas before we move to uh, talking about the debt profile. For now, we'll just take a short break. Stay with us. You're welcome back. It's still the run-up, and we today are focusing on the debt profile of Nigeria. But before we go deep into that, we needed to find out some things about the budget and the prospects that budget holds for Nigeria. Before the break, Dr. Biodun Adedikpe, economic consultant, was talking with us and and giving more light to some of these things. And Doctor, I'd like to re return to you because even though the question was not. Um, the approach that the government should take, you started pointing out some of the things that need to be done. We'd like to just still talk about that because making a pronouncement that this is the budget, making provisions that inside the budget is one thing, but the, the strategy to implement this budget is yet another thing. So I would like to know, if you were to advise the government, what strategies should be put in place to make sure that the implementation of this budget is for the good of Nigerians and they will get close to 100%, if not 100%, implementing this budget? Excellent. Now, when it comes to execution, there are two important things you must do. First is defining very clearly your priorities. That talks to sequencing because you have in there in the budget a list of things you want to do. So sequencing is very critical because getting some things done will enable and empower you to do some other things. Mm -hmm. So we therefore talk about the components of that budget being properly sequenced. The second critical thing is what in the private sector we call performance management. And that means there must be a system within government that ensure that whatever we are planning to do first quarter, there's actually a scorecard at the end of that quarter to tell us what percentage did we execute. The portion we are unable to execute, what were the reasons? So we want to then make corrections in the second quarter. We do a similar thing in the second quarter, when we finish second quarter, beginning third quarter, we do an evaluation. How far did we go? with what we are supposed to have executed in the first half of the year. So now, the moment you bring that in, we call it, you have now made your budget and strategy measurable. That's the way I describe it for the private sector. Okay? Making strategy measurable is simply the fact that you have identified the initiative, what we do specifically in the first quarter. End of that quarter, you now look at those initiatives, how many of them did you execute? The ones you could not, what were the reasons? Was it because you didn't have the money? In which case, they were no cash back, as we call it in you know, fiscal operations. Or the, you had a situation where the preconditions were not met. Now, in strategy execution in the public sector, we also talk about preconditions. Which means certain things must be in place before you can execute a particular component of that budget. So in which case, the people in charge must not only be conscious and aware of this, but they want to also ensure that they track it. So those are the things that make success of budget execution. So if they do that, then Nigerians will fare better with an execution of this budget. Okay. You gave a staggering uh, figure earlier on, 1.9 trillion naira. Trillion spent, naira, yes. Spent on import. Import per month. Per month, yes. not even per year, per yes. month, 1.9 trillion month. naira. That is quite a lot. Uh, but yeah. what did you see in the budget that could give you hope that production, local production, may increase in 2023? Yeah, thank you so very much. Now, and this relates to the issue of debt profile we also want to examine. 
Oftentimes, people make reference to infrastructure in Nigeria, but we miss out the reality that in the last eight years, infrastructure indeed in Nigeria has improved. That's the reality. And in fact, a lot of what we see in their profile today relates to projects. They were infrastructural projects, they were delivered. And I again say this with every sense of responsibility. Being in a position then in 2004 to advise Obasanjo's government to do what Buhari is doing now. And he received advice from the World Bank that if he invested out of our foreign reserves then in infrastructure that to trigger inflationary pressures. And I made it very clear at the time that when you have your external reserves at greater than 20 months import cover of your import bills, whatever is above that, you can take a portion of it to develop infrastructure. But that was the advice of the World Bank to him in 2004. Now, for me, as an economist, infrastructure anywhere you go in the world, we call it an enabler. All right? Now, some 11 years ago, when I did a review of Nigeria's infrastructure vis-a-vis -vis 10 other countries that made up the next level that led us to developing the financial sector strategy in 2007, that later became, became Nigeria's vision 20, 2020. All right? I was involved in that in 2007. Now, when we worked on that, we identified infrastructure as a major enabler. By 2011, one of our leading banks, let me be specific, First Bank, asked me to do some review of infrastructure in Nigeria vis a vis the other 10 countries in the next 11. At that time, Nigeria rated poorly. Why? Because we had a rail line in place that was not functional. We had roads in place that were mostly tarred, but they were also not in moderate condition. So the question for me today as an analyst, what I saw 11 years ago is completely different than what I'm dealing with today. In which case, there is rail at least working in three corridors in Nigeria. A good number of our roads also today are motorable. And in fact, my typical example is Lagos by the expressway. And now you take also the concrete road in Lagos, the second longest in West Africa. So all of these are developments that happen as a result of the focus on infrastructure. I've been to Bonny Island as a consultant many, many times in the past. Way back to 2003, let me say. Okay? And each time I went, it was on the waters, in boats. Now, a bridge and road is linking Port Accord to Bonny Island. That's a major infrastructural improvement. So, when I look at all those and I tell myself that, look, I sat briefly in the government for three months in 2011 as an advisor to the president of Nigeria at the time. Okay? And I recall that there was a particular notorious bridge that different governments over the years had mentioned in their budget. And that is the Oweto local bridge. That bridge is done right now as we are speaking. Okay? So for me, therefore, when I look at different issues over time that I've been privileged to interrogate and also advocate policies, over the last 40 years, by all means, Nigeria's infrastructure position today is better than where we were 10 years ago. So, when that happens, of course, the implication for the economy is that travel time will reduce, and therefore there will be more time available for economic activities that will enhance productivity. Once productivity is enhanced, people make more money, companies make more money, pay more taxes. And so it connects also to government revenue as projected for the future. So all of these things are interrelated. So when you take them together holistically, then you can now say that, all right, I expect an improvement in the economy this year. So that is where our own perspective is coming from about the growth of the Nigerian economy. You ask the, sec and, uh, the next question, what specifically this infrastructure you're talking about uh, will do to improve our economy? And you've started touching on them. Maybe there are some more that you'd like to talk about. Because even the federal government on its own said uh, at one point um, last month, it was on the news, they kept talking about it, that it, some people are building infrastructure 
where they didn't need any. For instance, some states were doing flyover in villages that did not need flyover because there's never a traffic jam there. It's an infrastructure put in place, but it, the people do not need it, and it's not going to translate to any economic uh, advantage to them. So specifically, yeah. apart from the ones you have uh, uh, mentioned, how are these particular mm -hmm. infrastructures that you're talking about going to help us pay back the loans that we collected to do the infrastructure? Very good. Very good question. Now, this is the way it goes. Now, when you look at infrastructure globally, that is across different countries around the world, in my research, I discovered something that the debt profile of companies vis-a-vis -vis the quality and state of infrastructure, there's a nexus of 67%. Which means most countries, very few are exempted, actually borrow to develop their infrastructure. But what has played out historically, I'm talking here about history in some countries of over 100 years. All right? Now, where you now find that as infrastructure improves, the economy expands, government revenue also grows, and so they have the capacity to repay the loan. Now, where the challenges for me in Nigeria is this. We are not generating sufficient revenue from the infrastructure delivered to be able to repay those loans. That's an area I believe the incoming government will have to look at. Yes, it means basically that if the debt is serviced long term, yes, we have a long time period of time to repay, which is something we are very much interested in as analysts. Now, that is on the one hand. But the issue is the revenue to repay the loan. Where will that come from? There can be a disconnect between infrastructure being delivered newly and the revenue you are generating. I've had comments, for example, about the second Niger Bridge. And there are some, you know, let me say stakeholders, you know, advocating that there should be no toll on the new the second Niger Bridge. That is an aberration when it comes to infrastructure delivery. And people also must be more developed what I call the world view. The world view will take you, for example, to China. All right? I use China as a model for your address government in 2008 when we created the concept of infrastructure Nigeria. All right? What we said then was that what Nigeria is doing today is something that China had done before. And that is to develop railway and build it as a network of four by four. Then develop expressways network of four by eight. In which case, when you develop infrastructure, it is towards locations where there are economic activities. And that is what your question is actually driving us towards. So when you develop infrastructure that will enable economic activities where they currently take place, that will create economic value. If, for example, I want to travel to the east from Lagos, just to illustrate with the second Niger Bridge. And I don't want to pay toll because toll is on the second Niger Bridge. Then I'll be compared to go through the first Niger Bridge, where I will probably encounter more traffic. So in which case, if I choose to pay the toll, that is the price I'm paying for convenience and also crossing the River Niger within a shorter period of time. That's the way it is all over the world. Roads are told in China. That's why I made reference to China. That's why I'm going here. Roads are told in China. Okay. We want to pass through the expressway. The same thing is in the U.S. We want to go, for example, from Dulles Airport in Washington, D.C. to Maryland. All right? There are tolls on the expressway. If you don't want to pay tolls, you take the, the road that bypasses the express. It's as simple as that. That's the concept everywhere in the world. We also are developing and delivering railway projects. But the question is, how much is the fare for a regular trip? When you aggregate the fares, the question is, to what extent will that go in servicing and repaying the loans taken to deliver those projects? That is where the disconnect is. For the federal government, yes, it's very clear. But as you made reference to state governments, now for state governments, federal government has no control over them. They choose to do what they want to do, either for popularizing purposes or for any other purpose of probably delivering a project from where they can get some, you know, extras, funds, some other activities, whatever. But the point is this. We face federal government here because their whole jurisdiction is national. So any project delivered 
that will bring improvement in productivity. How do they also, within the context of those that use those, you know, infrastructure, also generate revenue enough to repay the loan over a defined period of time? In fact, that's the whole essence of public-private partnership, where private partners are involved. So these are the issues that we have to again interrogate. Probably Buhari's administration will not do that within the remaining four and a half months they have in office. Possibly the next government will have to consider that. So we have people now have to pay economic value and not see those projects that cost so much as social projects. So they are economic, not social. Okay. Um, right. Well, if it's education, education is social nature. Health is social. Doctor Dedicate. Economic infrastructure. Hey, Dr. Adedekwe, just, just a moment. Um, yes. I'm, I'm concerned about the people who will have to pay the tax that will make the government to, to repay <laughs> the loans. Um, for instance, um, the ASU president just said that um, education loans should be increased from 3% to, education tax rather, from 2.5% uh, to 10%. And financial experts came out to say that it is very wrong. The timing is wrong, and uh, that that increase has just been done. And that when you when you put all the tax that uh, companies pay together, you go from one tax to the other. Uh, at the end of the day, you find out that companies are paying up to about sixty five percent. Correct. Yeah. So. If the companies are paying this much, individuals get to pay this much and all that, do you think the economic uh, situation is favoring even individuals or corporate bodies enough to tax them even more because of the infrastructure they are enjoying? Well, it's not about taxing them more. It's about if you have to run, I will give a live illustration. If you go to Frankfurt in Germany today, the rail line within Trans Frankfurt City was constructed several decades ago. I was made to understand that the loan taken to construct that railway is still being paid. All right? So now, it means projects of that nature, usually the loan you take to deliver them is over a long period of time. Now, the, the challenge I see with Nigeria is this. We look at any money we are owing as something we need to pay immediately. It's not so anywhere. And that is why people like me challenge the Obama's so administration about the so-called debt relief that is not done for any country anywhere in the world. It was a big aberration. But, but must, we, must we copy everything? Uh, must we copy everything? Because, for instance, uh, exactly. some people are That's saying we are selling our soul, as it were, to the Chinese, mm -mm. who are now trying to build Not police stations and all that in our country, and owning That's some of the infrastructure argument. in our country. So is it's it good for us? Argument. I dismiss that interpretation. You know why? Because the loans we are taking from the Chinese are cheaper than the loans we took from the Paris debt club. I may have interrogated that space in the 1990s, OK? So the loans are cheaper, they are longer tenor. So the critical thing for us is this. Are we using the money to deliver what we intended to? Give you another illustration. I have a in Nigeria. Go to our airport terminals. What we have today in Nigeria, not what we had for, for five, six, seven years ago. Rain had beaten me in Panako before that canopy. A Panako airport. Today they have a terminal building. So now that is geopolitics. And we must also recognize this, that when it comes to economics, it is your interest that should be primary, not the interest of the other party. Nigeria is not selling its soul to China in any way. If I will get infrastructure delivered by a country next door to me in Nigeria, I will go get them to deliver it because that's the problem I have today. So I won't go by the sentiment of alignment with one person or the other. And that is the problem Nigeria has its independence. Okay, I've had occasion to be invited by foreign governments to analyze our economy since 1960 to date. Okay, talking about the issues we have, that has been a major problem of our government here. Because we always think about alignment. Instead of, like you rightly said, instead of looking at ourselves and developing what works for us rather than copying from others. Even when we copy, 
We copy poorly, we paste poorly. So that is where our real problem is. For me, it's about we have infrastructure deficit. How do we fill it? Okay. If I um, cheap loans from China, longer tenor, it's good for me. Yeah, doc doctor, because the time is running yes. out, let's let's cover some some more things. My concerns. I, I know no. that the train of thought is good, but you said when you build infrastructure towards your source of income, as it were, I don't uh, remember right. the exact words you used, but infrastructure towards where you make money. Um, That's and right. then I, I come and see the railways and the roads that have been done in this administration, yeah. and I get worried that, for instance, there's no rail that directly leads to the port, so much so that we don't even need the tankers that have been blocking that Papa Road, for instance. Uh, and then we're talking about building infrastructure. So why, why, why was there need to build infrastructure, but without taking it to where we can evacuate the goods, make our economy faster and better and grow uh, astronomically? Uh, we're just building infrastructure. And then another thing is Ajakuta Steel Complex that has taken like 40 years and it has not been completed, which would have generated a lot of uh, things for us and make uh, the economic revolution or industrial revolution in Nigeria complete. The refineries are not working, but it, infrastructure have been put in, pay, in place. Are you not seeing that as a misplacement of priorities? I don't see it as such. Let me explain that to you because I've been a part of this conversation for long. When Obasanjo's government came up with the real master plan in 2004, it was just an idea on paper. All right, 2008, we brought the four year and infrastructure, you know, infrastructure Nigeria concept. The idea was to have at least three by one network of railway in Nigeria. And the idea was rehabilitate the existing lines from Lagos to Kano, rehabilitate border call to Meduguri, they meet in Kaduna, then also create a third line from Kaduna to Wari. In which case, we have it appear, it appear, we pass through Ajakuta and then to Abuja, then Kaduna. So you have three lines running north to south. Mm. And then you have to take a line that runs west to east. The concept there was to take one from a that runs through Akure, Odo, Bini, and then Onicha, then Enugu. Enugu is on Podako Medubri line, if it is on Lagos Canal line. So Nigeria will have three by one. Now, in my interpretation, as somebody outside the government, that is what I see this government doing. We case, let's develop the rail network that will enable, for example, the inland container depot in Erumu in Oyo State to be by the rail line that has been developed newly, and therefore you can move goods from Lagos to Ibadan service or your state. The same thing we apply in the east. The line from Podako that goes to Meduguri passes through Enugu, there's a station close to East Gate Inland Container Depot, which is in Abia State, all right? Just 700 meters to East Gate. Now, that rail line will therefore serve that Inland Container Depot. That's a dry port. That is the concept that China used to become the manufacturing ground for the rest of the world. So, and we envision that Nigeria can become the same. Have all these rail lines, they are networked in that manner. Then we have Inland Container Depots in Kano, in Kaduna, and also in Bauchi, all of these are connected by the existing rail, rail network. So if you do that, then I can site my factory anywhere in Nigeria and then ensure that my raw materials come from anywhere in the world. Easily, I can pick them up from the internal container that the dry port close to me. Equally, when I produce for export in the same manner, get it to the inland container depot, it gets on the rail line down to Lagos, for that of warrior, the case may be, and the goods can be shipped out. So that is the concept. They are all interrelated. But these things cannot happen overnight. That means we do them systematically, one step after another. What I expect is that the government that comes in, we continue with that scheme. Okay. All right? So by the time we have this in place, then a manufacturer can site his factory anywhere in Nigeria that is not far from the existing rail line and the inland container depot, that's the dry ports. That's the concept. They are all related. All right? So if already we see a government that now took that idea and is implementing, what we need is another government to take it further to get us to where we are vision to be. 
I was a part of the conversation, March 1990, ladies and gentlemen, in Paris, in France, where we had the conference theme as how Africa can become the manufacturing ground for the world. Way back in March 1990. So when we are talking about things like this, there is history, okay, of what we have vision for Nigeria and Africa. Okay. But unless uh, we do that and we get a lot of discouragement for those who see Nigeria as a market for their goods. Okay, Do Dr. Adedikwe. Well, uh, yes, today is about uh, debt. And we had to yeah. sweep all the corners before we ask the simple <laughs> question that we are asking as a right. final one. Our time is up. Um, yeah. The Ministry of Finance has said that there is no cause for alarm, no matter how much is being borrowed. In fact, the presidency has said only a credit-worthy person can be given uh, loans, so Nigerians should not mm -hmm. worry. But we've also had this information that by May, if the ways and means borrowing that the federal government still intends to do comes off and it's being signed, uh, it will mean that we will go into a debt of about 77 trillion naira. Should we be worried or not? Well, I will take that from this perspective. Now, when it comes to waste and miss and fancies, it is borrowing from the central bank as the lender of last resort to the government. Okay? So, it then also means that when government borrows from the central bank in huge sums, we call it hot money because it has a tendency of triggering inflationary pressures. That is of concern, that is worrisome to any economic analyst. Mm -hmm. So what that also points to is to ask ourselves the question, and I'm addressing this to the government itself, what is the cost of governance? Why is it high and why is it rising? And there's a whole lot of things we can do that can help us reduce the cost of governance. So in my own estimation, the outgoing government or the administration might not have the courage to do that, because it takes courage to deal with the cost of governance in Nigeria. Mm. But the incoming government will have that opportunity to deal with that within the first six months of coming to office, at least mm. before this year elapses. And what we have said repeatedly over the years, I served in the presidential committee to look at this issue way back in 2010, 2011. All right, we made some recommendations to Nigeria's president, then President Jonathan. So we also have the Orosa A report, the Orosa A committee's report. Let Nigeria go back to those two reports and see specific recommendations made to reduce the cost of governance. If we do that, then the government will not need to borrow hot money from central bank to deal with its recurrent expenditure. But that is what is playing out here. Okay. So if we are able to deal with that, then we wouldn't need to borrow so much and also borrow in such manner that can trigger more inflation. That's the real challenge there. But if government borrows to deliver infrastructure, Nigerians and stakeholders, I am all for it. If we borrow to deliver infrastructure, I'm all for that. Okay? Because that's a major thing that enables economic activities. So that's okay. my view about that. Yes, Various government may not have the courage to deal with that right now. But the strong message we should repeatedly put across to whoever is taking office after him is that that issue must be addressed frontally, cost of governance. Mm. Okay, uh, Dr. Adedipe, it's been a very enlightening run with you this morning. And we'd like to thank you so much for coming on the show to enlighten us on matters that ordinarily were, were breaking our hearts. You, we've had so much mm -hmm. courage by talking to you, but whatever needs to be done, I'm sure the Nigerians who are listening will have to take the reins of leadership themselves because leadership or governance depends on how the people are actively involved in it. Thank you so much for coming on the show this morning. Thank you for having me. I do enjoy the rest of your day. Okay. We've been talking with Dr. Biodun Adedikpe, an economic consultant. He is a founder and a chief consultant at BAA Consult. And we've been talking about the uh, debt profile of Nigeria, but we dealt even more uh, on the uh, budget of Nigeria because everything hangs on that. How are we going to grow or otherwise because of that budget? 
and should we be alarmed or not? Those are the things we were uh, discussing. You can also join the conversation and uh, follow us on our social media platforms everywhere. For now, we'll take a break for the news. Stay with us.